Winspiration, the way to the essential. On UK Health Radio, Winspiration brings wisdom and information for an extraordinary future. Together, we can shape the world we want to live in. So let's get real and create the idea. Be extraordinary. Welcome to another episode of Winspiration Radio. And this is today very exciting. At least for me, but hopefully also for you. Today, I will talk with a person who knows me for years. And she is a person on planet Earth, um, besides my sister, knows me as long as. Um, I guess we met around 50-something years ago. So, uh, she watched me in different stages in life. And uh, now here in South Africa, um, I met her again. I was married there. Um, we divorced 2002 officially. And people were wondering, 2001? Okay, that was February. <laughs> that was the life of why we divorced, maybe. Like I said, I need to correct it. Uh, but... She, soon you will see her, and uh, and uh, so we had a very interesting uh, time. And human people say, "Why do you divorce? Um, you divorce more with more love than most people live together." But our understanding of love was always, "How can we support the other person to live out the best?" And we was first the time uh, that we said we need to go different ways in life. Um, she is the author of a book. Um, it is says the princess is dead long live the queen so she wrote it when she turned 50 and uh, was uh, what is the next we say, most people say the next Harvard life and we, we lost a little bit of contact we were always stayed in contact but we didn't met so much and just last year and she always said I need to come down and see South Africa and okay, I said, I take a look, Switzerland in the winter is the cold, I come in July for a week and check it out if I want to stay there longer. And now I for a few months in South Africa and meeting her again. And we are starting working together again. We had a company of personal development uh, in the 90s. And she is a wonderful, super experienced coach, archetype all that she is. Consulting on a high level is really incredible what she knows. And today, she developed more and more an understanding of what is consciousness, who are we, what truly, truly are. And that is the topic of today. And uh, here she is, Rebecca. Rebecca <laughs> Berlin Sonnenberg, this wonder woman, the queen. Thank you for that mighty introduction. Yep. And it's really interesting now. So we are sitting here in the area of the hotel. We will do the seminar in the first week of uh, February 2023. And we already had a lot of kind of brainstorming and, and, and learning and talking about what is consciousness really. But before we come to that, is what made it from the first coaching, personal development, your... Really, it was an interesting journey also in going in the coaching, the top sessions, uh, really hot seminars with difficult people to really go to archetypes and now consciousness. I think I was, um, from my early childhood on, I was a strange child. I asked my mother already when I was around four years old if I'm alive or if I'm dead. Um, I, I was even younger. She took me to the doctor and asked if the child is okay. And he said, she has too much fantasy, but she's okay. Um, so my mother let me be that way. I learned very early to read and was interested in everything. And I always felt, yeah, that I have a special gift of seeing patterns between people and having a perception a lot of people don't have. But we would say in German, 
I could hear the grass growing before people could even see any green. I, I was just seeing a parallel world. And with that, I never felt really fitting in because others didn't share that with me. And when I talked about it, I was taken to the doctor or I had other problems with them. And even at school, it was not really um, something which appealed to the teachers. And also, I had um, those glimpses of um, kind of past life experiences, which were very irritating. And we were, you remember when we were meeting, by the way, I was 17 and it's 60 years ago. It's scary. Um, when we met um, and we, we came together and we started then our relationship as well. I told you, I trust in you and confided in you that I said I have sometimes these these glimpses as if I have lived other lives and in history. And I couldn't talk with anybody beside you about it until then, when in the later, when I was in my 20s, later 20s, there were the first therapies coming up where I could see people who were in that realm as well. And so I learned this is just special perception. It's, it's kind of okay. So combined with my creative side, I was always coming from art and design and being very creative, uh, which gave me a lot of freedom. So in combination with that, I could do more and more um, yeah, communication with people and going into these realms and starting to actually, by being a consultant, using my my skills to see those patterns in people, to see sometimes lines of people behind them. I, I could use that and um, I grew into it more and more. And in a way, it was just, it was satisfying. It was fulfilling me and it gave my life purpose. So I had to find my way around it. And um, when I'm doing executive coachings with managers and things, that is not part of it. When I'm working with clients and one-to-one -one on a personal basis, it's sometimes in it. And some friends of mine, they know about it. But mainly I live that part with myself and with others who are coming to ask for, for advice. And then during my long life, um, more and more people since the around the change of the centuries, more and more came bubbled up actually about um, scientific research about consciousness and so on. And I thought all of a sudden when I heard things from people like Donald Hoffman, or meanwhile, Bernardo Castro and all these people. I said, they understand me. They are on the same page and I understand them even without understanding. I just listen and can say, yeah, that's it. That's exactly how consciousness is working. This is, that, that fits with me, that suits with me. So, yeah. So actually, the older I get, the more I can grow into it and the more I go into resonance with that. And, um, can use it and finally I feel more and more actually I belong to this world. To which world? That's the present. To the, to the bigger one. Bigger one. <laughs> because yeah, if you follow consciousness scientific research about consciousness today, the very state of the art one, then it's it's easily said that we are, what we actually um, believe as our reality is is so 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 limited, and consciousness is the whole big spectrum behind it, in it, before, after, all around it. And um, so it's just an expanding state of awareness, which brings you closer to consciousness. Before we go, go deeper into what it could be, like I said, there's so much what more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, for the people that I don't get it yet. What, or how do you explain so simple things? Somehow I guess everybody knows there's a spectrum of light and we can see only this. There are animals that see more. Some people who have dogs, they know there is a pipe for the dogs. You don't hear anything, when, oh. but the dog hears it. But anyway, we have the experience. They see or hear something what we don't see or hear, but we know it all. Yeah, that's a, that's a big thing. I mean, that is um, the arrogance of our self-perception that we think that we are the number one in the food chain and that we are the peak of creation. And um, that is, I doubt this. Uh, definitely when you talk about the dogs, um, about birds, 
insects, they see a total different, depending on the species, they see, they see total different uh, spectrums of light. And uh, I just heard recently, I'm bad with numbers, but I just recently heard that our, um, the, 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 the part of everything which is available in this, what we call reality, that we see only 0.001% of it. So our perception is so limited. And that's uh, what we could see. That's what and we could this see. This little, we reduce it to our patterns or so, so our worldviews. And we think that is actually the measurement for everything, that it yeah. is what, what, what it is. And uh, we think dogs are stupid. And sometimes I look at my dog and I think he might be smarter in a lot of um, perspectives and aspects than I am. And um, I always remember, do you remember when we once, when I had, you picked me up from California for my education and we went to Florida and there was the professor who was working with uh, dolphins. We wanted to go swimming with the dolphins. Remember that? Mm -hmm. And he said that guy short before we arrived, he stops working with um, doing research on dolphins because he felt it is not the respect that he wants to show an animal which is smarter than we are. So he said, I back off here. These animals are so much smarter how they deal with life, with their societies, with everything. They are so much more capable of things. I back off. And um, I think sometimes we should go with that approach, perhaps not that extreme, but we should have that approach for a lot of things when we look at it. Um, yeah, just to, to see that a flower for an insect is a total different entire world. And for us, it's just something from Kenya or from here or from something. We put it in and then we throw it away. It is, we have not the respect sometimes, which we are most of the time, which we should have, which not only is disrespectful, to creation or whatever it, we want to call it, but it's also cutting us off from so many experiences because we all know these moments when we sometimes take a breather, when we sometimes have a special situation and calm down and we sit in nature or have one of those special moments and all of a sudden, sudden we see details and, and, and aspects we were not aware of before. These are enlightening moments. And we miss it by cutting it off by it's only this, 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 and having that what Hoffman and a few of those scientists call just our virtual headset, which we have, which gives us just a part, but we don't see the whole picture. Yeah. Um, when you talk about the flowers, we, I think we don't need, even need to go to uh, what they say, because in the 60s, someone tried to figure out if plants can feel and it, the interesting part they took this from the light detector the plants that was a Kilian photography photography uh, yeah but it came later no no it just was a, someone who just with the light detector wanted to check if plants can really feel uh, and and he came with matches or fire and says I burn you and no reaction no reaction and he said it again no reaction so he wanted just to get rid of his idea that they can feel something, and he was a little bit angry and wanted really to burn them now. And suddenly came the reaction. So they not only could feel, so they got the intention. So they realized that he's just talking about something has nothing to do with me. And then they made another uh, experiment, testing the, uh, the flowers, and they had a little bit of electroshocks, uh, little shrimps. Yeah. And then they could see the plants had emotions when, when you torture the animals. So um, I always like to forget it when I eat my salad. But uh, a lot of vegetarians say, oh, protect the cow. We just eat flowers. So there we should know it's so much that. already. And then for sure, if you go in the different space, there is so much more. I mean, when you see how much water is in a plant, mm -hmm. and we go now to that. I mean, I know that Emoto, that Japanese man who made those mm -hmm. frozen crystals, I think his experiments are in a little bit doubt, 
doubtful in a way from the scientific uh, uh, community. They say the tests were not done the right way. However, when you see what um, has recently been done by more people from the scientific community about how water reacts to to words to 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 actually even realizing um, things and 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 their picture. I mean, we talked about Vida Austin, and yeah. I think she's in Australia. Her uh, experiments. So when you see that water is reacting so strong that we are connected with water, interconnected. And I mean, there is water. We are water. More than seventy percent, I think, of um, the human body is water. It helps you water. What are we talking about? I mean, yeah. and um, yeah, and I mean, I remember that one when I interrupted you before. Sorry, I always do it. <laughs> um, with the Kilian photography, there was that guy having that little speck boom. That is those those the money trees we called it in, yeah. in, in Europe, and he pinched them with his fingernail, his thumbnail, every time he got into the room, and they could see when he came into the room before even pinching that the flower inside made this kind of because just he's coming again the pincher so um yeah bad news for the vegetarians yeah yeah and somehow it's a really good news that there is so much more where we are not really yes accepting yes and, and you told with the brain or for this zero point zero zero but it's also it's a normal science normal brain science says okay we grow up creating patterns and we let impulses from the outside in maximum 10%. But then we want to have a picture from 100%. Yes. So we go to our drawers. What can we add to it? And then we just... Make it complete. Make a complete picture, which is 90% the old stuff, which was, was in the drawer. So we don't yes. see with the eyes. Anyway, you don't see with the eyes. It's an imagination, but we don't see with the eyes just with our paradigms. Yeah, that's... That's the next question. What do we really see? Who who actually is observing? Who is seeing? Uh, there are so many aspects to that. And uh, but before we go deeper here, I I think. But it's also interesting uh, what you talked about um, the plants that they are that they realized the very moment it got serious and it got aggressive. The question is, what do they realize? Do they realize the seriousness of it or the aggression? And I think that is for me interesting, um, being also a hypnotherapist and working with emotions, um, which have frequencies and so on and so on. I think if oh. we look at the the universe, at reality, and you go, let's say, we are here in Africa, and you see what's happening when... Um, a predator that could be a lion or something is chasing an animal and gets it, which, by the way, is a hard job to be the number one in their food chain is a tough job. However, so he gets that animal. These animals are switched off. They res they actually respect it in a way or accept it in a way. And they have a program to shut off and then they are eaten. And um, uh, we realized that when we had our cats and dogs, when we were married, uh, we had one cat, always you remember, he brought in all these mice and everything. And they were like hypnotized. They were just there with huge eyes. And if you took them outside for rescuing them, they were still sitting there because they had decided, okay, that was it. I check out here at the place. And I think that there is something that animals, plants, whatsoever, we all can accept when it is for a reason. But if it is just to destroy, which is the opposite, when it really is pure aggression, which would be the anti part for, for love, mm -hmm. I think everybody is reacting. I've seen people... I want to understand dry that you say kids in school exit because of like the mice. <laughs> that was it. No, my life is over. Yeah, I mean, that's but kids are doing. And that. then they walk. Or youngsters that. And they survive till grave. I don't know exactly what you mean by that, but I think that no, we, they come, like, when you are in a chain of things and, and there is a chain of reasons, I think we can accept a lot of things. But I've seen really tough men 
who are real, who have been through a lot of stuff and have seen a lot of stuff. But when they see somebody really being aggressive in a way against the child or something, not all of them, unfortunately, we see that now in our time now that it's unfortunately not with all of them. But there is a soft spot. We we want to love. We don't want to be nasty. And um, so that pure hatred and aggression, even if a lot of people follow that line, if you really bring them to a point, they they don't want it. And we want to live in love. We want to live in harmony. We don't want to be in... Uh, oh, that is interesting. It's, it's called a theory. Absolutely. Uh, it's a what if. Yeah, yeah, no, there's a lot of like these experiments uh, when the students uh, says, okay, there is... Um, they, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you yeah. make it worse and worse, but they, they punish them or give more electroshock the electro- till they kill them. So they get more and more and more higher that the other person can stand. And like it's instead of school, because somehow I felt in school, first of all, we needed to sit still and which age... What is good for the love is, is crazy. And then it told me you learn for life. But what life? It had nothing really to do with me. Exactly. Yeah, so that's why I partly checked out uh, there. And, this is what you're related to, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that, that's a very complicated, actually, that's a long interview or a long talk uh, to go deeper into this. Um, because we come to the point where Everybody wants to belong. This is our probably the 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 yeah the, the major part in us. When we come into the world as human babies, we are so helpless. We couldn't survive yeah. two days or something without being seen, accepted, without belonging, yeah. which actually imprints us for our entire life heavily. That we always try to belong. So the people we are living with, they can do all kinds, even strange things. As long as we belong, we accept it and we say, okay, that's the way to do it and to be part of it. And um, it depends in which environment we are growing up and how the people who are raising us are giving us what kind of, of, of values and ideas they give to us. But most people... When they grow up, they are not so confident and 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 safe inside to say, "I don't want this, I want this." They just follow what is the program no, here yeah. in order to belong and not to be the loser. So when now an experiment comes with electroshocks, and I'm on the good side, they won't give me electroshocks, and I go with it. And so that is, it, it's a nasty, nasty dynamic this which is taking place. But I. Wonder I've never talked to anyone, but if I wonder if you take one of these people out and would wor- work with them and talk to them, they know it's wrong, and um, they would love to have it differently, but they can't. There's a dynamic. They are, and that is when you see gang rape or, or all this, or when when you hear soldiers in an adrenaline pumped situation, they do all the atrocities and every, and then they say if they reflect later on. Uh, yeah, it was just like, like yeah, in a blood thing. It was just running, pumping. It was just this. They didn't reflect at that moment, but when they reflect, they know it. They know it. So can we take this and like that? The water can read. Um, I actually believe the water can't read the words, but the words and all languages have yeah have a kind of collective field around. So there's a frequency frequency field. So, and if you put me in a position where I go, like in the family constellation stuff, I go in a frequency, and suddenly, if I'm not aware enough, the frequency takes over and just play the role. Yeah. This is something which I think is is in our reality, a point we are in, in, in fields we are. And, um, as I said before, with our imprint, we want to belong to special fields, and then we. we go. But um, yeah, sometimes the whole point is if you don't start 
reflecting. If you don't do any kind of contemplation, meditation, whatever it is, if you don't sit down or lay down at that, that's not the point. The point is if you don't step away from your life and start reflecting it, actually developing consciousness, actually building up your awareness in a way that you start to say, I'm not only taking it all in, I start to reflect it. So going to a self, whatever you want, soul, whatever you want to uh, to name it. If you don't start this, then you are actually easy bait for all of this and everything can happen to you. But the very moment you have, you step out of that game and you you can say, wait a minute, what's going on there? And you can see the what I call the game, even if it's sometimes not really funny. But then you can see it and you can decide. Okay, that's a good um, point now to make a short break. And we all can reflect now on what is going on okay. in this short break. We <laughs> okay. UK Health Radio, the station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. You said a couple of times with this word belonging. Yes. We we have a need to belong. So when we come to the conscious topic or where people have a kind of ideology or God, if I don't belong to, to something here on planet Earth, I need to belong to something, so then I take a religion, or if we are not really in religion now, then I believe in the different consciousness and whatever. Um, so, <laughs> actually, and we will do that next week when we are doing the seminar, um, the point is talking with people, uh, with humans, about love. Ask Ten people, ask hundred people about love for definition. You get hundred responses, answers, definitions. And um, the same is when you ask for God. Who is God? Beside the fact that there are several kinds of religions. Um, yeah, so who is God for you? The source, whatever. What is it for you? What does it mean to you? We get new very individual uh, definition. But when it comes to religion, then we are definitely in this reality. Um, because you said outside. God might be, when we talk about consciousness, further that it could be there is something outside. I'm open for that talk. But when it comes to religion, and this is a very earthy program. Because it's always separation. My father used to say, God is great, but his ground personal, not. So, religion is a program made by humans, uh, which probably started always with the best ideas, but in most, and I can't say it for all religions because I'm not uh, uh, the one who knows everything, but in most cases, form has won over content. So the sense is gone long it long time ago. Now there are rules and form and you have to do this and this and this. But it gives you belonging. You are part of a congregation, you are part of a group, you are part of let's say I just saw something about the Vatican, which is an old institution. You can be even on the top of that institution and so of that religion officially. Um yeah, it the the, the belonging thing is like we are on a hook. And as I said before, if we don't stop for a moment and realize that we are on a hook of the belonging thing and actually take it out in a way and say, okay, um, to whom or what do I want to belong? And why do I want it? Because then we come to... Who is I? That is a name. I don't know, I think we have to talk for hours, but we have a seminar for a week. However, 
um, the point is that the first thing is we want to be long because of that basic anxiety. Otherwise, I can't survive. Yeah. So. Do I I'm, really want to belong or do I want to survive? That's it. Do I want to be a prosperous and loving part of a, of a group? Or I'm just there depending on them because I need them. And I'm afraid I can't make it on my own because I'm insecure whatsoever, don't have the self-worth, whatever. This is, the point is that people want to belong. And um, I mean, every so often when I'm working with clients, they have so many problems in their families. But family is a big, big thing. Each Hollywood movie gives you family is everything. But then you dive into families and you think, wow, that's really complicated. And there are nasty things happening. And this is far away from love only. And um, But it's family. So that's the number one. That's the core belonging is family. Then we have later on, I need a partner because of belonging. So then I have someone who I can grow old with and who is doing the whole program which we have established in our life here in our reality you have to do school and then you start a career and then you have a partner and then you start a family and the house and the car and the university for the children and then your pension fund and then goodbye so we have the whole program and the partner will help with that so that whole thing is a question who are you what do you want and um Whatever you have built, is it really the way you want it? Or can you actually adjust it more to yourself? It's not that I'm against those programs per se. No, 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 no. But the question is, why am I doing it when I'm still afraid from my early childhood on that I can't survive without that? Then I'm doomed because um, I lose myself. And I always like that one sentence of Dennis Finch Hatton the famous pilot in out of Africa when she said, but I want this and this. And he said, I don't want to die one day at the end of the life of somebody else. And that's the danger. If we are not really getting aware of who we are, don't develop the consciousness to say who we are, can't see us in a bigger picture because when we go into consciousness, then the question is, there is a much bigger system we are belonging to. We are not that needy as we think. But this depends, and you can only get into this when you're stepping out of the box in which we are living and which we call our reality. Someone said, humans are an hackable animal. Oh, yeah. And uh, Very much prone to. That is, uh, I think, we, we don't want, like, who, who am I? And as we are not really ready coming on, on planet Earth, so, because the brain is too big already for a normal birth, so we again we are so programmable. We come in this defined world, and we feel that it's not me, but we want to survive. So we adjust and we create a persona, and then this is a normal way that we just play this, like someone says. Uh, tiptoe safely to grave huh? <laughs> yes. and, and to make it and never really have lived or the top five regrets of the dying they regret what they didn't do and um, number one is I didn't live my true self so if we would live our true self for sure then we can be happy if we do what we are um, so why we need then if we live our true self or is it possible if we are not then going to consciousness or is it only if we have more connections to other dimensions that I can live my true self? I think when I remember many years ago when I did a seminar, I mean, are we talking something like nearly 30 years ago? Uh, I did seminars where it was a one week seminar. And I asked my clients in one exercise, I asked them to bring photos of their childhood with them so where they can see themselves as a child between five and ten. And most 
the best would be if they would bring a photo where they actually really look into the camera and so they are now have the photo where they can look into the eyes of the child they have once been. And the exercise was about asking the child and realizing all the dreams and, and ideas and, and, yeah, all the energy the child had. And now looking at that from the adult, 20, 30 years older, 40 years older, at the children, what do I have accomplished? What do I have made out of it? I've never seen in any of those seminars that nobody cried. They all cried and some cried their eyes out because they realized their child was somebody else, unspoiled in a way as much as you can be, depending on your individual childhood. But there were ideas and, and there were dreams and there were wishes and there were skills, and then life kicked in the way you have to do it. And um, with all of that, and um, yeah, I think we are badly, badly, badly damaged in that way. And um, the point is that in today's, and this is what I think answers your question probably even more, our life has become so complicated, so complex. Okay, I have a dishwasher, I have a laundry machine, and I have an automatic car, and I have my computers. But if we look at it at the end of the day, it's an overwhelming life. We have so many influences. There is, if you would go 150 years back, yeah. there were times where you could sit and reflect, and you could be, the, and you had your, your chores, and you had things, things to do, you had also time for yourself. You there were gardening and whatever you could do. But parting with when you see that today most people are totally overwhelmed. And I think from being overwhelmed, it feeds our anxieties and our fears even more. So it makes me even more depending on doing the right thing in the eyes of the right people, which actually program me to and it, it it's like it's a spiral down. Yeah. So yeah, and a lot of people do it now, and that is perhaps sometimes as serious and sad as it is. A lot of people have breakdowns. A lot of people have severe crises in their life more than it was earlier. I mean, if you look at the generation of my grandparents who survived and lived through two world wars with all the challenges. They never had a breakdown in that way. They just could cope with it in a different way. But we are so overwhelmed. Our systems are shutting down. We see so many children and teenagers today just not only shutting down, they shut. I mean, what I said before, we have more suicides in the Western world of teenagers and young people than ever before. I think this is this is really an alarm call. And but the system that we we think the only way out is to stay in it. Because then I know it and I know the ones who are with me in that cage, whatever you would call it. There I know what I have. Uh, here we go. And um so that is very sad. Mm -hmm. But the crisis between when it comes in a breakdown, when it comes in a severe illness which you can survive or something, that can sometimes be the wake-up call that you say, what am I doing here? And sometimes these people have a chance to take a turn. I've seen it in people. But, um, yeah, the others, some, and some people just continue afterwards, going, going, going. Yeah. And we, we don't learn anything alternatively. We, nobody is questioning it. We are pumping up children at the moment uh, with medication to keep them what I say disciplined in school or something uh, I'm doing that that with a charity worker I'm, I'm, I'm working with children in art classes and um, they I'm working with children from a special school they have special needs I mean it is sometimes it is shocking how they pump them up to make them quiet and the children get told the idea that they are wrong no, the system is wrong. We just shouldn't medicate children. We should see that the, the system is sick, not the child. And 
the effect on the child is, in a way, I'm sick, I'm wrong. And the child grows up immediately as somebody, I need others and I can't do it. And the whole disaster gets even worse. Uh, it makes me sometimes really sad to see it. Let's have a break. Okay. UK Health Radio. The station that makes you feel good. The station that makes you feel good. So the system is sick. And, and now as an individual, it's a hard time to change the system. So what do you suggest? The individual, besides what you mentioned already, the reflection. What is it? The main tip you give someone, okay, if you really want to do something, this is a daily ritual or whatever. That is, I mean, if I would have that key, I would probably, yeah, be world famous. But, or if they would listen, that's another point, because the system is protecting itself. What I think is... Um, I wrote that book once when I turned had turned fifty uh, about the youngest fifty people in their fifties than ever and and wrote how much we have as a potential in front of us now being in my later sixties, I think the first thing which I really love about getting old is again I mean some material. Things are not so good. <laughs> and so, but the the thing is from the consciousness, from awareness, from my personality. Um, I have lived through that catalog and program which we have to do. So when you ask me, with, really meaning old, I just have more experience. Yeah, the question. Yeah. But this is yeah. But this is what I and I have been through. But when I see young people giving them advice, first of all. Rule number one is give only advice to those who ask. They don't ask. This, if they ask, I'm happy. The other point is they have to have um, their way through it. And if they choose to go the whole program for the whole package, then they have to go through it and have their moments where they say, wait a moment or not. And um, mm -hmm. figuring it out for the first midlife crisis, the second one, the third, whatever is coming. Um To work in this perspective with people, I have realized from the mid-40s on it's much easier. Because then the family part, the career part, the establishing of things has taken place. And then there comes the question, wait a minute, what is it here? I mean, the ones I meet, they are the ones with the question. The others I don't meet. But the ones I meet, they come with, what is it? Uh, why I have done everything in the catalog and I feel empty. I feel hollow. Nothing is really, they, they promised me that I will be now happy, but I'm not. So they are coming and, and, and now we can start to work. And then we go into consciousness work, which is, um, yeah, going into leaving that, that hectic state of mind, going into other states of mind. Through meditation, through uh, um, hypnosis, through several practices, and to talk, to talk, and to develop um, an idea of myself, which is able to reflect what I'm living, to see that it is a game or a headset when we come to those uh, uh, words, but that that I'm taking part in of something, but it's not me. I'm taking part in this, but I can step out of it and can make my decisions and can relate to other things. And then it's a process. But it only works for people who are coming. So the one perfect advice, sorry, no. Yeah, and if we really believe that everybody is really special, and yeah. to what I heard, um, and not experienced in that, hopefully a lot of time, Before experiences, even in death, it is not that everybody experiences the same. 
So it's still there. It's very individual, everything. Um, so that would mean society, families, everywhere. We should really acknowledge these uniqueness. Like I grew up after the World War II and uh, learned at home everybody eats the same thing and be happy that we have something on the table, mm. even if it's not good for your metabolism. We know today everybody has a different metabolism, so it should be the normal thing that mommy cooks for the kids different. And in in sport, they do it. Like I know from Liverpool, their FC Liverpool, they cook for every player different meals because they know they love what this person needs to be in best shape. Um, so there is a lot of them. There's a lot more just for the body. Um, so what makes you really, really happy and it's not always the same car or the same ritual. And not, then is one more point. Mm -hmm. What isn't the whole consciousness game? What is body? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, when I see how much we emphasize today body and, um, and, and don't get me wrong, I don't eat everything. I'm quite aware of what makes me sluggy, what makes me feeling better, better sleep. When you get older, you start about thinking, what did, I mean, yeah. However, uh, we see in the body, and it, it's very important for so many people, what kind of workout and, and this and this and that. And you have to work out otherwise, you know. Mm -hmm. And immediately comes that if you don't do it, but then, mm -hmm. and if you don't eat the right vitamins and so on. We always made a joke when I was in California, uh, He died, that guy? Oh, did he, didn't he take his vitamins? So that was like we, we get the idea that we are uh, living forever if we do everything right, which gives us new stress on top of all the stress we already have, which I think sometimes just relax. And as long as you are doing these things with stress and with fear behind, skip it. Law of attraction, you get what you put the energy. Yeah, exactly. And then I always try to point out there was Stephen Hawking. The world, one of the greatest minds in, of the last century into this century. And that guy was told he has to die with 25 because of his severe sickness of his body. He never worked out because he couldn't. And he made it up to 75. So I think consciousness and keeping that one muscle inside here, the receptor for consciousness, the radio receiver here, keep that fit. Uh, skip the illusion that you have to be at up until 100, totally fit by eating this and this. I don't want to be totally fit, but I've lost my marbles. No. I mean, it has not to be the only alternative, but just to see it in, in a, who am I? I'm more than my body. And, um, yeah, my personality is not my body. Even if my body might be nice and something, but how much energy do you put on your body and on yourself and what are you and who are you and then we are in the next discussion yeah and the interesting part is when we're lazy to learn and or we don't think um, understand that we focus on the body or the material stuff because we're coming from a world where we survived only your richness was I have more land than you I have more cows than you or whatever so to be rich I need to steal from you the land um, and then we had the industrial age. But then one day we came to the information age. Mm -hmm. So it was not about land, cows, and who is the richest people on planet Earth today? Is Bill Gates the richest person because he has more cows than ever, so whatever. So, But we don't make the transition. The, to the, but the principle behind is still the same, exploitation. Yeah. Yeah. You're always, I get as much as I can. Greed and exploitation is still behind it. No. Yeah, that is the energy which is behind it. But if you really understand, we are in the information oh, age. Yep. And there's a big difference. If I have 10 cows and give you one, I have only nine. Yes. If I give you the information I have, I still have, have it. it. I still have it. So we can grow things. It's not about we need to take it away. Which is a big chance for mankind. Yes. And now I have to apologize, you and you, because I started, let's talk about consciousness, and sometimes we mention the word consciousness, 
but uh, it was uh, maybe a big uh, warm-up or overture for the first act of consciousness, but not for this session, for this episode. I hope anyway you got something very interesting. out of it. For me, at least, it was really, really a pleasure talking after so many years, after we know 60 years. Uh, I feel it's uh, really a young discussion, though. The new life is coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I promise you, I will do my best to get there on another episode and we talk about consciousness then. So far, be inspired and join us on the next episode. This was another episode of Winspiration Wisdom and Information to support you getting out of illusions, false identifications, limiting beliefs. We all have the power and potential to be more, do more, have more, give more. Reality is what is possible in the universe and the best is yet to come. If you want to dive deeper into possibilities of creating the extraordinary future, go to winspiration.global or to wolfgangsonnenburg.com. More information and some free downloads like the email program Dream Goals Reality or a copy of the book The Best is Yet to Come can be found on the UK Health Radio website under the Listen on Demand and Presenters section. Join us again next week on the Winspiration Show for more wisdom and information to create your extraordinary future.